A popular idea today is that good souls go up to heaven and that bad souls burn in hell beneath the earth, the underworld. But this belief is an evolution of an ancient one shared by many cultures across the world, that the underworld is the place that we all go to when we die. And what's interesting is that the descriptions of the underworld from different cultures share common themes. There are obstacles to overcome. They almost always include rivers. There's often a ferryman that guides the soul. And despite being a place for the dead, the underworld is also a place to discover secret knowledge. Hi, my name is Sandra and welcome to Chasing Gods. Today, we'll explore the common themes of the underworld shared by various cultures around the ancient world, and we'll seek to understand why humans have come up with these common imaginations of a world they could not possibly know. To most of the ancient world, from Mesopotamia to ancient Greece to Japan, all newly deceased souls travel to the underworld or netherworld and reside there indiscriminately. As mere shadows, continuing a purposeless life. That's why people bury their family members with their favorite objects, in order to make their residence in the underworld more tolerable. To the ancients, the living reside on earth and the dead reside in the underworld. This view is consistent across most world myths and religions. The idea could likely be due to the fact that since Stone Age, humans have buried their dead in the ground. It's difficult to know exactly why they did so, but many theories point to hygiene and showing respect for the dead. Corpse being devoured by animals is not a pretty sight. Their stench is not a pretty smell either. It seems only natural that the early religions imagined a world of the dead beneath our feet. All souls journey to the underworld, but the ancient Egyptians took it one step further. Souls will eventually face judgment. The bad souls, whose heart weighs heavier than the feather of the goddess of justice Ma'at, ends up destroyed. The Greeks eventually added a judgment system to their underworld, or Hades though the judgment was not necessarily morally fair. One of the judges of Hades was, after all, an ex-king from Crete, who himself had done various evil acts. Souls were directed according to the composition of the lives they led. Distinguished souls were sent to the Elysium, where their afterlife was easy, ordinary souls to the Asphodel Meadows, and the bad souls were sent to Tartarus, located deep beneath the underworld, where they would be punished for their sins. Sounds like today's biblical hell, huh? Well, the Bible was first translated by Greeks, so it's no surprise. Let's move on to the next theme of the ancient underworld. The underworld is a place of many obstacles. As if souls had to prove their strength in order to reside in the underworld. The Zibalba, the Mayan underworld, which means place of fright, is a place full of tests, trials, and traps. There would be rivers full of scorpions or rivers full of blood, which the souls must cross. In other religions, the souls must overcome the obstacles prior to being judged. The ancient Egyptians write about their underworld, Duat, being divided into 12 sectors, representing the 12 hours of night. Each of them contained obstacles that involved demons and supernatural animals, followed by a gate guarded by a goddess who would test the knowledge of the deceased. Overall, the courage, strength, and memory of the deceased was being tested. All 12 gates must be passed in order for the weighing of the heart, or the judgment of the soul. All of these details are found in ancient Egyptian funerary texts, which were discovered in excavated tombs. It's concluded that ancient Egyptians would bury their dead with these inscriptions to aid them in surpassing all the gates of the Egyptian underworld. Of the underworld obstacles, rivers are extremely common. There's almost always a river that the dead must cross. There's the Finnish Tuonela, the Maori Rahohenga, the Miklan of the Aztec people, and let's not forget the famous ancient Greek river Styx through which souls must cross in order to reach the gate where they would be judged. The presence of a body of water seems to be of great importance in the underworld. Perhaps to symbolize life? 
In the Hindu belief, as mentioned in the Puranas, one of many Hindu literatures, there are three main worlds, the heavenly, divided into seven levels, the earthly, and the underworld, or Patalas, divided into seven levels, beneath which there is the Naraka, the Hindu version of hell. The Naraka's location varies depending on the scripture, and at the very bottom of these multiple levels of existence, there's a big ocean called Garbhodaka. Again, its location depends on the Hindu scripture. Hindus, along with Buddhists and Jains, believe that souls remain in a level of existence for a finite amount of time, depending on their karma, and would either go up or down a level, again, depending on their karma. Water might also symbolize transit or transport. Transport is also represented by a ferryman or a guide in underworld stories. In the Greek Hades, Charon is the ferryman riding a boat on the river Styx, and he only boards souls that have had a proper burial. A proper Greek burial also consists of leaving a coin in the tongue of the deceased. That coin is to pay Charon for the crossing. In ancient Mesopotamian mythology, the ferryman is Oshonabi, and he is mentioned in the oldest written poem where he guides a hero named Gilgamesh. The ferryman is essentially a guide for the newly deceased souls. They can also be called psychopomps and aren't necessarily represented as a bull pilot. The ancient Egyptians imagined their psychopomp as a canine deity, Anubis to be exact. Just like how the ferryman onboards people and takes them places, the dog, being the man's best companion, is his guide. You see how the ancients' renditions of the world of the dead is based on concepts they understand in the real world? Another example is the ancients' understanding of death being permanent. So, ancient myth-tellers would illustrate the underworld as a place of no return through peculiar stories, often involving the ingestion of underworld food causing irreversibility. For instance, in Greek mythology, Persephone was abducted by the god of the underworld, Hades. Zeus had to appease her distraught mother, so he allowed Persephone's return, but unfortunately, she had eaten six pomegranate seeds from the underworld, which bound her to it eternally. A similar plot is seen in the Japanese creation myth. The father god, Izanagi, traveled to Yomi, the Japanese underworld, to retrieve his dead sister wife, Izanami. But because the latter had eaten food from its furnace, she was bound to remain there forever. Myths also suggest that visitors are allowed into the netherworld, but cannot bring the dead back to life. Again, with a certain narrative pattern. This time, of losing faith or not following the instructions. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, Hades allows Orpheus to take his dead wife back in one condition, that he doesn't look back. On their way out of the underworld, Orpheus couldn't help himself. He had to be 100% sure that she really was behind him. Because he looked back, he lost her for good. Same goes for the Japanese creation myth, where Izanami was given a second chance to return to the living world with her husband, under one condition, that he keeps walking and does not look for her. Unfortunately, he lost faith and did, and found her decaying corpse. Dead people just don't come back. According to ancient myths, the underworld is also a place where wisdom, treasures, and knowledge reside. In the Hindu belief, the seven levels of the underworld, or patalas, is the realm of the Naga snakes. And despite the patalas often interpreted by modern Hindus as a hellish place of monstrous beings, demons, and greed, South Asian scriptures describe Nagas as supporters and protectors. Nagas are associated with water, and like water, they can be dangerous, but are often beneficial to humans. In the Hindu creation myth, the king of all Nagas supports the Lord Vishnu as he rests. In the Buddhist myth, a Naga shelters the Buddha from incoming dangers. Nagas are also seen as the guardians of jewels. The Puranas describe the lower realm as even more beautiful than heaven or Svarga, like an underground paradise filled with light-emitting jewels. The ancient Maori people also saw their underworld, their Rahohanga, as a heavenly abode. In fact, they saw it as equal as the upper heaven, and it is up to the dead to choose between the heaven above or below to reside in. 
which also makes sense from a burial practice point of view. Other methods of discarding the dead exist, such as cremation or letting vultures eat away at dead corpses, a practice known as sky burial. These methods could have led to the idea of dead souls traveling upwards. Nonetheless, the ancient Maori believed that the wisdom that brought about their customs and rituals, such as their facial tattoos, came from the underworld. For some reason, the humans of antiquity envisioned the underworld as a place of knowledge. In Sumerian mythology, the underworld, or core, contains, now check this out, a tree that bears fruit of knowledge. Now, if this doesn't ring a bell, though unlike the knowledge of good and evil as explicitly told in the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve, this knowledge is of sex. Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love and war, really badly wanted to eat from that fruit, so she asked her twin brother, the sun god Utu, to take her there. So he did. And because Inanna ate from the fruit of knowledge of sex, she became knowledgeable with sex, hence also being a goddess of sex. Myths of secret knowledge and wisdom residing in the underworld are abundant, and it makes one wonder why. Perhaps it's due to the regenerative forces of the earth. Put yourself in the ancient person's shoes. You see trees and fruits constantly reproducing out of the soil. Inside it, there are snakes, worms, and creepy creatures of all sorts, which could likely have influenced the idea of obstacles in the underworld. One must be strong to endure that. Also, once buried, dead bodies eventually disappear. Without understanding the science of nature, one can only believe that beneath the earth reside magical powers, powers of reproduction and transformation. Today, through science, we understand that soil, water, and sun provide the chemical energy to turn a seed into a tree. We understand how bacteria and fungi decompose organic bodies. Nonetheless, religions continue to exist, though their narratives have evolved. The underworld of today is associated with hell, where evil souls are damned to suffer in lavas of fire hotter than we could imagine. Perhaps this evolution of idea has also to do with the association of Earth's excruciating heat with suffering, or the association of the skies with respect and of creepy creatures below our feet with disrespect. Some would theorize that as humans advance from animals and have become wiser, they walked upright with their head higher up, whereas animals, less wise, are closer to the ground. Some associate evil with the ground for other reasons. Nietzsche had called the devil the spirit of gravity because through him all things fall. Religious narratives evolve as human understanding and conceptualizing about the world evolves. We reject religious narratives that don't make sense to us anymore. We keep those that do, whether scientifically or symbolically. And sometimes we're so attached to old narratives that we try to make them make sense to us. That's human nature. We tell stories, reassess them, modify them in order to understand life and to cope with it. Thank you for watching guys, I hope you found this episode interesting. A big thank you to my Patreon supporters. This YouTube channel is currently a one-woman show and is in dire need of your support. Check out patreon.com slash chasinggods to find out how you can help and receive perks. Another great way to support the show is to share it with your friends or on your social media. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.